We all have dreams, but dreams by their very nature can be difficult to achieve. That's where Access Credit Union comes in. Whether it's going to college, owning a car or building your dream home, your local credit union can help you to fulfill your dreams. Access Credit Union, funding dreams for over 50 years. Close your eyes and pull like that. On the senior A grade and previewing the clash of Bandon and O'Donovan Rossa in Balnascarty at 6 o'clock on Saturday. In a few moments, we'll be joined by Skibbereen's Daniel Hazel and Bandon's Mark Sugro to preview the game. Later in the podcast, we're going to be looking ahead to the Irish Offshore Rowing Championships, which are being hosted by Bantry Rowing Club this weekend. And we'll hear from Dermot Murphy and Andrew Hurley of the organising committee but Kieran, i mentioned at the top castle haven's loss to nemo on sunday you were in situ at cork gaa hq what did you make of the game it finished nemo 3 7 to castle haven's 13 points that old cliche that goals win games round through with parky creve last sunday uh nemo, nemo got three goals did they get four goal chances and they took three of them like it, it was clinical and um castle haven Created very, very few goal chances. I can't think of any offhand. There was one actually to start of the second half uh, when Cotton McGuire was in true, but the ref had blown it back for a, a foul further out. Um, Nemo were the better team on the day. They were um, they were just just a, a better outfit. They raced into one four to to one point lead inside the first quarter, and Haven were on the back foot straight away, and they expended huge energy to get back to it in a point at the start of the second half. But that's when Luke Connolly struck for the first of these two goals in, in that second period. And Haven are always chasing the game. They're always playing catch up. They could never, they could, they could never draw level um, or, or even push a, a point in front. And um, so impressed by Paul Kerrigan. He really had a good game the last day, Jack. He's he's turning 35 later this year, but he rolled back the years. Um, he was the best player in show there. Um, set up Connolly's two goals, kicked the first two points himself, set up the last two points. Generally, just ran the show for for sections of the game. So I don't to have any qualms about the winners like Nemo War. What a better team! And geez, there's some club for winning county titles. I think that's 22 now. It's back to back titles. They're four since 2015. Like they're just a they're just a county title winning machine. Yeah, you mentioned Paul Kerrigan there, and the old adage is that the first thing to go is your pace. But one thing is for certain, Kerrigan's pace is still there in bucket loads because when he turned on the afterburners there was no one in the castle haven back six that could keep up with him and his accuracy shooting points is just a thing of beauty to watch when he takes on a shot you kind of already know in your heart of hearts that he's going to find the black spot so yeah he was extremely impressive and as you said i think was it a record equaling or record breaking uh, yeah. number of county title wins he's after securing now no he's won nine county uh, senior football titles which is which is a record like that's incredible um he's forces back in 2005 so he's he's now won as many county senior football titles as west cork's most successful ever senior football club clan who've also won nine titles but that's 
nine titles by Clan over their entire history, and Kerrigan has has racked up nine since two thousand and five, which which is incredible. Um, you mentioned his pace there, like he think about Parky Queen. It's such a big open pitch. You know, thinking a fellow, okay, thirty four, turning thirty five in a couple of months' time, um, uh, maybe a big pitch like that won't suit him. But he was eating up the ground and. Even towards the end of the, the game, when he was gassing a bit, he was just down in front of us, um, the, down in front of us. Uh, and you could see almost kind of, he was on a hard over trying to get his breath. But once he got the ball back then, he's all that experience just to pick a pass. And he, yeah. like I said, he set up the last two points. I think it was um, Barrio Driscoll and James McDermott. He just clever again. And even look at Kerrigan's passes for Connolly's two goals. Like, so just really clever passes, but not... Not only that, not only can he spot the pass, but he can execute it as well. It's just uh, just a lesson there for for a, a load for everyone watching. Just a kind of a, a model pro. Um, but Castlehaven, it's not one that got away. It, it's not one that got away from them. Like they didn't deserve to win the last day. They were they were off the pace a bit. Um, good feel for them in some regards because they only got the Cahillans back in training just last Wednesday night. So what four or five days out from the game. So that's. Damien, Connor, and Jack, who who have been hurling predominantly for the last twelve months. So, from the last time that Haven played in the championship, the three Cahillans have all gone through two intercounty hurling championships each. Um, Jack at under twenty, and then Damien and Connor with, with with the Cork seniors. So, Haven didn't have a settled team coming into it, and you could see that in that open quarter, they looked like a team trying to find their feet and get to know each other again. And that's when they slipped six points behind. But like I said, credit to them. They got back. They got it back to a point. Um, Brian Hurley, even though he wasn't moving as freely um, as he usually is, but that's obviously because of the, the hamstring injury that, that he's been suffering with. He still kicked eight points and he was um, he was their leading light. You'd, you'd wonder what a fully fit Brian Hurley would have done if the Brian Hurley that we saw down in Clarny that day that ripped Kerry apart in those first 15 minutes. If, if Haven had him inside there, um, what could he have, have done to that Haven defense, that Nemo defense? Um, but like I said, I don't think they live any crimes, Castle Haven. They, they know they came up short. They know where they came up short too. Like they had nine second half whites, and some of them are pretty poor as well. So they've um, they've plenty to work on ahead of the new, the new championship, but they don't have any time to feel sorry for themselves either. Yeah, well, it was an entertaining game. It was great to see uh, at least some fans back in the stadium. I think there was around 3,000. There was a good atmosphere. And as you mentioned, there's no time to waste because the new championship gets underway in just a matter of a few days. And as I said, we're going to focus on Bandon and Skibbereen on this week's podcast. But before we do, just one more story I think that's worth touching on at the top of the show. And that is Sheffield United's newest signing. And that is, of course, Bandon's Connor Howran, he signed a season-long loan, Kieran. And what do you think this means for Connor's career going forward? It seems like a good move, considering the fact that there is a strong Irish contingent at Bramall Lane. There's obviously Dizzy McGoldrick, there is Enda Stevens, John Egan. I'm sure there's another one or two that I'm forgetting, but their bottom or second bottom of the championship, five games played, no wins. But from Connor's perspective, he's going to play a lot of football. 100%. Um, I know he captained Villa in the, the Carabao Cup against Barrow last week, um, but that was his first appearance of the season for, for Villa. And if, and, and if truth be told, he's not going to play many minutes for Villa in the Premier League this year. He was on the bench right for the last two league games, but he never came on. So he wants to play first team football. He's 30 years of age now, he's turning 31 in February. So, like, there's only a, a certain amount of, he knows that that window to play at the at the highest level only lasts a certain amount of time. So he wants to play minutes and he should get those at Sheffield United. Um, they've obviously they were relegated from the Premier League last season, so they're they're down in the championship and think they haven't started the season well. Like you said, I think they have two points after after five games. But there's a good team there and it's a good club. So it seems like a good fit for Connor. And uh, it's a season long loan deal. And he's also in the last year of his contract with Aston Villa. So what it means so like he's not going to play for Aston Villa again, but come next summer, he'll be a free agent. So he'll have almost the power in his own hands to decide what the next move for him will be. So from, from the outside looking in, it looks, looks quite a good move. He's going to a good solid club. Um, with, with, like I said, there are a lot of Irish lads there who he'll know pretty well. They have a good pedigree. They should shoot up that championship table once they find their feet. It's probably obviously being relegated was a setback, and um, they've uh, they, they need to get going again, and and they will. Connor will play minutes. That will help him with Ireland too. 
um, if he wants to keep his place with that Ireland starting team. So it looks it looks a good move, a uh, good move for Connor. And before he gets to Bramall Lane, he's obviously got a big game on Wednesday night down in the Algarve as Ireland take on Portugal in a World Cup qualifier in Faro. Manchester United's newest signing, Cristiano Ronaldo, is looking to break the all-time record for international goals scored. He's got Ireland trying to stop him, which I find hard to envision. But Connor is likely to start as Ireland look to get their campaign back on track. So that's Wednesday night. We'll be fingers and toes crossed that he can do the business down there, that Ireland can sneak a point or at least keep the score respectable and don't get into a position where we're going to miss out on a chance to qualify for a World Cup because we conceded 10 and miss out on goal difference or something to that effect. But anyway, let's leave the soccer chat there for now. And coming up after the break, we're going to talk to O'Donovan Ross's Daniel Hazel ahead of their Senior A Championship opener with Bandon this weekend. The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you by Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, funding dreams for over 50 years. On Saturday at 6pm in Ballinascarty, O'Donovan Rossa take on Bandon in the opening round of the Senior A Football Championship. In a few moments, we're going to hear from Skibbs, Daniel Hazel and Bandon's Mark Shogro and Kieran. This is this is a massive game to get the season underway for both sides. Big West Cork Derby. Both of them will have ambitions to go deep in this year's championship. Um, maybe before we go too deep into that game itself, what are some of the other key points that people should be looking out for this weekend as the championship gets up and running. There are some huge games this weekend. This is a county football championship weekend. So I will have a quick look at the, at the Premier Senior Football Championship first on on Saturday in Bandon at 2pm. It's Carberry Rangers against Aero Oak. And that's going to be a very exciting game, Jack, because Aero Oak are the, are the new boys at the Premier Senior grade. They're the Senior A football champions. So it'll be very interesting to see how Aero Oak get on against Carberry Rangers. And also in that group on Saturday at 4 o'clock, Castlehaven take on Newcestown in Clannacilty. Castlehaven are coming off the, the back of that last to Nemo Rangers in the final last weekend. Newcestown will be waiting in the long grass to try and spring a surprise. So that will be a very interesting game as well. Um, other local games to look forward to this weekend as on Sunday, again, in the Premier Senior Football Championship, another West Cork derby. It's Clannacilty against Ireland Rovers in Ross Carberry at 2pm. And th- that game will be... That's what I'm looking forward to as well, because kind of guilty, I consider it like a sleeping joint of car club football. There's some really, really good players there. So it'll be interesting to see how they kick their, their season off. Then at the senior eight football grade, I know we're going to be having a quick chat about O'Donovan Rossa and Bandon quite soon. But also in, in that same group um, this weekend, on Sunday, it's Ballingiri against Donnie's in Kilmichael at 2 p.m. So that's another another good game to look forward to. Bantry Blues also kick off their Senior A Football Championship campaign on Sunday. They, they can Clyder Rovers in Kilmurray at four. Uh, sorry, at two p at uh, two p.m. as well. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of games there, and even going down to the Premier Intermediate Football and Intermediate Grades, there, there's a lot going on. So it's going to be a very very busy weekend. OK, well, let's switch our focus then to the game we're going to chat about. And it's Bandon against Donovan Rossa in Balnascarty at 6 p.m. on Saturday. As I mentioned, we're going to hear from inside both camps in just a moment. But Kieran, just give us your own thoughts on both these sides. What are they looking to do in the championship this year? But Donovan Rossa first. They got to the semi-finals last year and they lost to Aero Oak, who then went on to beat Mallow and are now up at the Premier Senior grade. Uh, when Skibber looking back at that semi-final against Aero Oak, they kind of look back with a bit of regret because they know they didn't play as well as, as they could and they've seen now what Aero Oak have gone on to achieve. So Don Vanrasa at the outset of this senior eight football championship will be one of the, the favourites, one of the teams to watch. And having spoken to the people involved in the other three teams in the group, that's Bandon, Bellingiri and Donnie's, they all see Odon Rasa as the team to beat in this group. So there's a bit of pressure on Skib because there is that expectation that they'll go deep into this championship. Um, they have the players. There's some really good players there. They have that experienced cohort with the likes of Daniel ha- Daniel Hazel, uh, Ryan Price, Dunlock Hodnett, Dave Shannon, uh, Paddy Crowley, Kevin Davis, 
And then they have some younger players as well who've come on board the last couple of years and who've really driven it forward, like Rory Byrne, Dylan Horahan, and, and, and a couple of more. So they have a lovely blend there right now. I know they have a couple of injury worries. A few fellas are out for this season. A few fellas will be missing for for, for this weekend's game against Bandon. But this is, this is quite a good skip team. And what I liked about them last year is that they won games that they normally would have lost. Um, I was there the day they beat Bellingiri. It was just a horrible day, really wet, horrible day. And in past years, maybe there was a frailty to skip teams that they wouldn't have won these games that they were expected to win, but they dug out a win that day in horrible conditions. And I came away that day thinking, okay, maybe there's something different about this Skibbereen team. And they won all their group games. They won a cracker against St. Michael's. So... I think they're in a good place going in, barred a couple of injury worries that, that they have, because the mentality has changed there, um, that they're now able to, I suppose, carry that expectation and pressure um, better than they have before. Um, they'll be expected to beat Bandon this Saturday, so it's how they deal with that. Bandon, on the other hand, will be looking to get out of the, the group stage as well. There would be the same pressure and expectation on Bandon. They've lost a couple of of key experienced players like James O'Donovan, who's been a stalwart of Bend in GA for so many years. Um, just on James, he's true to the, the Cork Road Bowling Senior Final, and that's this weekend as well. So best look to James O'Donovan there. He's looking to finally bring home the big one in the senior road bowling, but Bandon will miss him. Like he was the leader of that defence. He, he, he called the shots back there, um, to just a big figurehead, and he leaves a hole in, in, in that team for both Skib and Bandon. Getting a win in that first group game is so so important because it can just kind of kickstart a bit of momentum and set you up for the for the next couple of games. Lose that first game and you're on the back foot um, straight away. Though Daniel Hazel would point out here, we'll listen to him quite soon. Era Oak lost their first group game last year. It didn't work out too bad for them. They're now up in the Premier Senior grade. So um, it's just great to have two local teams, two big towns as well. Skibbereen and Clannock Guilty, two huge West Cork towns, clashing in a huge. Uh, senior A football championship opener. Though you'd have to think Skib, given what we saw from them last year and the talent that they have, should prevail here. Okay, well, let's hear from inside the camps now. As we've mentioned, we're going to hear from Bandon's Mark Show group, but first, Skibbereen's Daniel Hazel. We're joined now on the podcast by our Donovan Ross's Daniel Hazel to look ahead to Skib's big game this weekend, their senior A football championship opener against Bandon. In Banniscarte, Saturday evening, six o'clock. And um, welcome to the podcast, Daniel. Thanks so much, Karen. Delighted to be here. First, first time on it. For first to many, first to many. You say, um, <laughs> I don't know about that. But we're here now, right? It's 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 the Monday of a championship week. We're a couple of days out from from this West Cork derby against Band. And like I said earlier, it's it's a championship opener. What's it like the week of a championship game? Like, what's the run up to to, to this Saturday going to be like for for you and the Skidnets? What is it like? I think, look, I'm I'm probably towards the end of my career now. I, I turned 30 a couple of weeks ago. So how I approach games now is vastly different to how I would approach them as a 21, 22, 23 year old. You know, look, at this stage, all the hard work is done. All your fitness work is done. All of your ball work is done. You've, done, you've played all your games. This week is just about, you know, controlling what you can control. You're, like people are sick of hearing it when you talk about Dublin, you talk about Kerry, you talk about Mayo, it's about controlling the control, but so that's making sure you're sleeping right Monday to Friday, making sure you're eating right, making sure you're recovering right, you know, just just taking care of your body all week long. Whereas when I was younger, I would have tried to, you know, I'd probably get myself tired or land the week thinking about what's coming up. And it's no, don't get me wrong, it's still important to visualize what the game is like and how you're going to play, but you don't want to expend all your mental energy before you get there on Saturday evening. You know, really, when it all comes down to it, all that matters is kind of the 70, 75 minutes around the match, Saturday evening, and probably a couple hours beforehand from, from using your mental energy. But everything else outside of that is just preparing for the week. You know, look, we'll, we'll train twice. We'll train Tuesday, Friday. Tuesday, we'll just be getting our set ball skills in, just going over what our game plan is Saturday. Friday, we're just going to get together, have a little talk. Friday is very late, really. I'd say very few people actually go on the pitch. And then Saturday, it's just, look, six months or four months of training, however much that's what it's all for. So really, look, the week is just about 
getting yourself right whatever way you can. And I'm look again, I'm lucky I've gone through a lot of championship years at this stage. It, I, I have, I'd have a routine down and it's just about being relaxed. For someone as experienced as yourself, Daniel, and you've played a, a lot of championship games just give over the years, would you get nervous or excited? Like, what's the feeling like, let's say, take me to Saturday morning, match day, a couple of hours out from, from travelling to bed to take on Bendon. What's that like? Are you still, is there butterflies in the stomach or what's the feeling like? Uh, big time, yeah. Look, I think, you know, again, as you get older, you start thinking more and more about the demands that football makes in your life. And let's not kill anybody. We're amateur players, but it still demands a lot of attention and it demands a lot of discipline and it demands a lot of hard work to get yourself into a position where you can perform for your team. And that's what it's all about. And, you know, you, you, weigh, up, you weigh up the pros and cons each year of doing this and doing that. Little knocks your body has, you know, you might be in a certain place of work, you might have a girlfriend, these type of things. And really, when it comes down to it, it all pales, in my opinion, against the feeling you get playing championship for your hometown. Like, I am immensely proud any time I get to go out and play for Skib with my Skib jersey on. The, the couple hours beforehand, you'd be ner- I'd be as nervous now. Well, ner- nerves mightn't be the right word, actually. I would have, you know, butterflies and anticipation the same way now that I would have had 10 years ago. I would have probably been more nervous when I was younger just because you're going out trying to prove things and this and that. But I'm a bit more confident in myself now that it's just, it's just anticipation coming up to the game. And, you know, but that doesn't, that doesn't diminish it in any way. You're still just as proud. It's still great going out. You know, if you happen to play well, that's great. But what's most important is your team winning and getting over it. And those days when you get through a really tough championship game, there's nothing like it. In my, in my life, I, I haven't experienced the elation that you would if you win a game by two or three points. And it's been really tough. Like going back to last year, we scraped through a couple of wins you know, really tough wins. And they're some of the best wins I've had in my career. And, you know, people would say, oh, that will diminish as you get older. If anything, it's better. But as you know, you know, at this stage, I've put, and other players on my team have done the same, you know, Ryan, Don Logue, Kevin, Mark, you know, we're all coming towards in our careers. We've all put 10 plus years in. So you understand the hard work it takes to get this point. So if anything, it means more. You're, you're, you're probably more, you have more anticipation and you get a greater sense of joy after it. But like, I mean, in the couple of hours beforehand, I'm, I'm a, personally, I'm a creature of habit. Um, I would do the exact same thing. I try to wake up at the same time, have the same breakfast, have the same mid-morning snack. I would listen to like the same videos, watch the same, or listen to the same podcast, watch the same videos, that type of thing. I would just be a creature of habit because it's all about trying to, again, you'd hear about all these flow states and that type of stuff. It's just trying to, again, control what you can control as much as you possibly can, because that 70 minutes, it, it can go either way. So you just want to make sure you're as prepared, the best prepared that you know you can be coming into it. And what a game to kick it all off with. Like, it's two big West Cork towns going head to head this Saturday night, Skibbereen and Bend. And what are your thoughts ahead of this game? And and even even for, for a first round game, the fact it's it, it's a it's a West Cork team, it's that derby element. Does that add even extra spice to the to the whole occasion? I would say it does, as it happens. My father's actually a banded man, so I'll be <laughs> I'm not sure who he's going to be screaming for come Saturday night. I look football, football in West Cork, it's the closest thing you have to religion outside of outside of religion itself. So does it add an extra spice being from West Cork? Yes, I think so. But we wouldn't approach it any different if it was someone from West Cork, East Cork, or North Cork. It's still, it's still championship. You're still going out to try and push your best foot forward and work as hard as you can and get the result for your team. But at the same time, is it great that it's in West Cork? Yes, because, you know, especially with things opening up in COVID and you, you can hopefully get people to watch it. It means a bit more of a crowd. It means some more people will have a better Saturday night. They'll enjoy themselves a bit more. But uh, look, they're banding our up and coming team only a couple of years ago. They were junior. Now they're senior B. Like it's an amazing achievement for them or senior two or whatever it's called. So it's an amazing achievement for them. And we have to be very wary that, you know, I'm sure they're looking at us saying these guys are on the way down. They're a big skull for us to take. They'll be a big scalp, I should say. So we just have to be, we have to be wary. And we, again, I said this to you last year in another interview where we are where we've fallen the fastest when we've underestimated teams. 
and we go out and we get absolutely hockeyed. And that's certainly one thing we're not going to fall foul of this week, whether whatever happens Saturday night, we're not going to underestimate the challenge that Banda will bring. We spoke last year, Daniel, like we spoke about this, it's almost a change in mindset for the, the Narasa footballers. And you could see it last year, like he came through a tough group in the senior rate football, um, great win against Michaels, hammered Nix at the start, and then a really tough win against Ben and Geary. Remember, um, remember that day being there? And that's the kind of win that stands out for me because that game was a dogfight. And that's a game that maybe in the past, like it was there was lashing rain there, a heavy pitch, but Steve could have lost that in the past, but he came through that and he won that game. So he passed each and every test. And OK, it didn't work out in the semi-final. Aero won that. You've seen what they've gone on to achieve. But could you take a lot of positives from, from what you showed in last year's senior rate championship? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Look, on, on the large, on the large, last year was a positive year. Like, a lot of things worked. And a lot of things we did, we did really, really well. And I, I, we, I, like, I can see a massive improvement over the last couple of years. Again, we're on, we're on an upward trajectory. And, you know, we want to continue that this year. But let's be honest, we, we still would have analysed at the end of the year and said, yeah, last year was a disappointment. We were going out with at least the goal of reaching the county final and then ever, and let the chips fall as it, as it may then. So, you know, like, let, look look where the championship ended after we lost by a point or two points in a rogue and they went out in the hockey mallet, mallow. So we were, we were very close to where we wanted to be, but we, we still weren't where we wanted to be. So, like, we have a lot of, there are a lot of things for us to work on still from last year. Um, and it's difficult to know how how we progressed from last year until you get into the heat of championship because you can play league games and you can play this and that and you might have 13 of your 15 or you might have 10 of your 15 but really until you get the championship games and you see the white hot the white hot heat of, of battle you don't really know where you're going so we'll we'll be able to take full stock of our progress from last year to this year you know Saturday night 9 o'clock so I'm just I, I'm look. We've done a lot of hard work. I'm fully confident that we're in a good place, but we're not able to really see the progress we've made from last year until probably next year. You know, or, or until next week. Like last year, we had a run of games, and it was great to see the progress as we went along. Like we were a markedly better team against Aero than we would have been against um, Ballingiri or something like that because we we had a lot of games and a lot of a lot of game time gotten into players. So hopefully we can get that run again this year. And that's the great thing about the round robin. You get three games at least. So it's fantastic that way. And about this round robin too, Daniel, that first game is so important because it almost sets the move for what's going to come in, in, in the following two games. Get off the winning start. It almost relieves some of the pressure going into the next two mm-hmm. group games. But if it goes wrong in the first game, all of a sudden you're, you're playing catch up and that adds to, to the pressure. So... I presume in the skip camp, it's going to be the right same in the Bannon camp. You're targeting a win on Saturday because you want to start on the front foot. Uh, yeah, look, absolutely. Every game, no matter when you go out, you're, you're always looking to win in championship. But I was actually thinking to myself this over the weekend, we want to win. And absolutely, it's our, it's our number one thing to win. But Aerog didn't win their first game last year. And Aerog went, went, went on to win the county. So, you know, it, there's no get out of jail free cards or anything like that. If you don't win your first game, you're up against it because the other your destiny is out of your hands after that so we are, we're absolutely out there to win we're going to put our best foot forward as far as I'm aware we have a full deck to choose from so there's no you know we won't leave any excuses at the door Saturday night we're, we're aware that Bandon are a really strong team and we want to go out yeah look winning winning is what it all comes down to there's, you're never going to go in because if you don't believe you can win or if you don't go out there to win you won't and that's just not how we're wired we, we don't always win obviously but we always go out to win you mentioned earlier too, Daniel, about the kind of that experienced cohort that Skip have at the moment. There's obviously your centres, Dave Shannon, Don Log, Hotness, uh, Kevin Davis, Ryan Price, uh, mm-hmm. who am I missing? Paddy Crowley, another fellow there. Um, mm-hmm. But you also have these young fellows who come through over the last couple of years, the Dylan Horans, the, the Sean Fitzgeralds, the Rory Burns. Uh, and David, fierce impressive. Or, you know, like mm-hmm. go back to last season again in, in, in a couple of games I was at, really good showing from young fellas. Like, how important is that that these young fellas? That they're not just coming on the team, but they're starting to emerge as real leaders in the Skip Green team as well. Oh, look, if I'm frank about it, we wouldn't be where we where we are if it's if it wasn't for them. These guys they brought in a sense of vigor, they really refresh the setup. They have a completely, you know, they're not bogged down or weighed down by 10 years of championship like we are. 
they come in and they're full of vitality. They're full of energy, you know, at our trainings, they're bouncing off their feet a lot of time. They're full of crack, they're full of energy. If, if, if we didn't have them, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we were last year or where we are this year. But, you know, really, and it happened again, a lot of the games last year towards the end of it, it was those, it was those guys driving down. It was Dylan, it was Rory, it was Sean Fitz. But even on top of that, like we have guys that are probably a year younger who even in our preseason this year, I've seen crazy improvements on from, you know, Kevin Hurley, Elliot Conley, Elliot's younger brother, Luke, Oshin Lucy, all of these guys, they, they work really, really hard. And the great thing about them is they're full of talent, but they're not, they're not willing to, to rest on that talent because talent doesn't get you anywhere to today. They, they back it up with hard work. You know, a lot of these guys, they're first over during their last lead. So, Again, from my point of view, it's great to see that because whenever we do finish up and my age group finishes up, it's great to know that we have these younger guys there who are willing to put in the hard work. And it's a it's a bit of a comfort for us to know that they're willing to do that. We're looking at the senior in football championship again as only days away from throwing. Um, it's a cracking competition. It really is. It's it's so mm-hmm. competitive with, with all the teams there. There's not much to choose be, between them. Um, how enjoyable has this revamp of the county championships been for players? Not, all, not alone are you are skib in a very competitive grade that you're capable of winning, but you also know for the next couple of weeks that you have a game this Saturday, that you have a game two weeks after that, and so on. It's really structured. So from a from a player's point of view, like you must give this the two thumbs up. Oh, absolutely. Compared to you know, the old rigmarole of, you know, first round and back door, and then you could be out and games were thrown this way and that. You could play one week and not play again for six or seven weeks. That used to be very difficult, but to have the game structured and play week in, week out is quite enjoyable. Now, in saying that, it's great in practice, but last year, you know, we went, I think, did we, I think the, our county board might have got the fixtures mixed up towards the end, um, and I'm hoping we were going to repeat of that, you know, like last year, we played, I think we played our first round. We didn't play a game for four weeks. Then we played two weeks after. And then we didn't play a game for five weeks. You know, so like you, it can be managed a bit better. And I look, I'm sure the county board are putting lots of resources to it. They put it, it you know, the, it, the club season is what drives the GEA. So just trying anything that gives more enjoyment to the club player is critical. And if you're asking me, which has been one of more, my more enjoyable years playing football last year, without a doubt, because you, you're guaranteed, you know you're guaranteed at least three games. And so all that training is worth it. I'm probably going to hear too, and you're probably reading the start away, that the other teams in the group are saying, oh, they're not our favourites, that they're the, they're the big name in the group, that they're the team to beat, and so on, considering what she achieved last year, and even the history of, of what Skip have done over the years, how does that mental of favourites for the group sit with the, sit with you, or is it something even you don't, don't even think about? How does it sit? Look, it would be I think it'd be false to say that you know it hasn't been mentioned at some stage within our training. Like we're we're aware of of that, and how would I say it sits? I wouldn't say it sits easily because, as I've said before, any time we go out with the notion that we're going to win a game or we deserve to win a game we get hockeyed and you know throughout the years I can think of four or five occasions where that's happened Clyde a couple of times you know just those type of games we, we can't afford in skib to think that we deserve to win because then we we inevitably don't so I would say that mantle of favorites it doesn't particularly sit easily with us we do you know you don't deserve anything until after the final whistle is blown and you, you eventually, the, the better team always wins. So you deserve what you work for on the pitch in those 60 minutes or 70 minutes and we're backing it up week in, week out. Um, it's, look, it's not something we concentrate on training at all. We don't ever mention it. You know, on Saturday night, the, the title of favourites or not favourites, whether it be us or Bandit, it doesn't really matter for anything. All that matters is 60 minutes, 70 minutes of really, really hard work and doing the job that you're going out there to do. You know, the title of favourites, it doesn't kick a point over the bar, it doesn't score a penalty, it doesn't score a goal. It's Look, it's a nice thing to have and it's nice things for other people to think about, but it doesn't it doesn't affect any of our training, it doesn't affect any of our decision-making um, and I, I, I don't expect it will at any stage. And changing that mindset, like you said, and that's what Steve have, have, have achieved. That's why last season was so important too because you kind of, you backed up 
you know, the talk, and you backed it up on the pitch with the performances. And like I said earlier, okay, to work out against Aero O, but you could take a lot of positives that that you were kind of like a new Donovan Rossa was emerging because we could see it last year with, with a new mindset and there was this, a new a new steel and toughness there that maybe we hadn't seen in the years before. So is the hope now to build on that, Daniel, and even take it on a step or two further again? Ah, uh, yeah. Look again, I I won't sit here and say we don't. Our aspirations aren't, you know, to at least get very very far in this competition. We we certainly want to get as least as far as we got last season, if not further. Um. I'd be up front and say to do anything less would be a, a failure for our club, or a failure for our senior team, a failure for our management. We're going out at least to get that far. And then, look, you get to the semi-final, you get to the final, anything can happen after that. You know, the day, anything can happen on the day. So at least just, you know, you want to work hard enough to put yourself in that position. And you're right, last year, we saw a different side to ourselves. We, we got the opportunity to, you know, work on a few things, test out, a couple of players that we probably wouldn't have got if we stayed in senior A, if we're being honest, um, or if we stayed in premier senior or whatever, whatever it's called. So yeah, look, it's it's been it's been refreshing and it's been great to be down in senior A. We you know it's given us opportunity, but at the end of the day, we we still want to be a premier senior club, and that's everything we're doing is working towards that. And the first step of that journey starts at Benes Carty, six o'clock this Saturday. The very best to look for the campaign ahead, Daniel. Thanks so much, Karen. Appreciate it. We're joined now on the podcast by Bendon, Jewel, footballer and hurler, Mark Sugru, to have a look ahead to, to this weekend's game against O'Donovan Ross. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, you're, you're playing Skib in Ben Nascarty this weekend. Pretty big game to kick off your senior A football chat and chip weight. Um, what was your f- first reaction when you saw that group draw? And um, Ben are in with Skid, Ben and Geary and Don. He's like, it's a fairly tasty looking group. Yeah, yeah. The, at the start, you were kind of half saying, did, did we get the toughest group? But with the, the teams in our division, oh, everyone is good. It doesn't matter who you get, really. Like Clyde last year, Donnie's, and for my, they were top three tough games as well. So it's going to be nothing nothing different, really. The only thing with Aero, Gano, I think they were probably a step above the rest of us at the time. And if you were to say who were the second best, you'd probably say Skibreen in one way, especially with their experience being the top grade for so long, where you could say we're still the new boys just after coming up from junior intermediate, premier intermediate. So it is kind of still new to us. You know, some, some of these people are, these, these teams, even Donnie's are seasoned campaigners now. So we have a, a lot of tough work ahead of us the next few weeks. Like I said, it's this Saturday, you're kicking it off against Skib. And what a game to kick it off. Like you said, Skib, one of the top teams in last year's senior football championship, they went down to Aero Oak, obviously went on, went on to win it. So what sort of challenge would you expect in our skip this weekend? No, oh, a massive challenge, yeah. Oh, even the minute the draw was made, Skib, we would have put down as the toughest, the best team, as I said, in our group. And trying to get a result against them would be tough, but to be fair, training's been going well there the last few weeks. Lads are working hard. Obviously, they have some marquee forwards, some tough backs. They're midfield they seem to be stronger it's hard to pinpoint even their goalkeeper it's hard to pinpoint any weakness in Skibberine's team you know it's the odd team you'd say geez, we could target them or we could target this area but at the moment there doesn't seem to be much of a weak spot of what I've seen in Skib in recent years anyway Does it help focus the mind so for Brendan the fact that you're, you're kicking off to this year's senior A football championship with a game against a, a tough team like Odonovan Rossa Definitely yeah yeah that, that's what you want really it's better than playing uh, in, when we were junior intermediate, you you always looked up to these teams like Skibreen, Ross Carberry, all these senior teams in West Cork, thinking why couldn't we be up there with them? So it's a great it's a great thing to get us focused at the start. And to be honest, the way the hurling and football has gone the last few weeks, that's what you kind of need to start off. Really, we had Charleville was our first hurling game last year, and to get the mindset for that as well was kind of stood to us to get 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 out of the groups in both hurling and football. So I think it's a positive thing, really. To be honest. And it, it almost shows too the journey that Bend in football has been on over the last couple of years. Obviously, been in the county junior A, what is it, five, six, seven years ago now. But so many Bend in players would have played junior against O'Donovan Rasta. And now, a couple of years on, the likes of Pep Prendergast and so on, going to be playing um, senior A football championship against O'Donovan Rasta's first team. So it almost highlights the journey that Bend in football has had. Yeah, it's mad. Yeah. So my, my first year in 2010. Junior Junior A, we lost to Clan. I think our first round and our backdoor game was against O'Donovan Rasa, and we lost that as well. So my first 
my first taste of you could say adult football in Bannon was two losses and one was O'Donovan Rasa. So it is it is a big step up from where we came from. We still have Pat, um, Darren Crowley, Peter, Keno Manny. Uh, I know we've lost a few a few big names in the last few years, even just this year alone. James O'Donovan would be a huge loss to us. He's um he's since I've been there, he's been like our main leader there, calling everything from the back and sorting us all out the week when we up the game. So you would miss him around the place and even Owen O'Donovan has gone living in Kerry now, so he's another huge loss. And Ronan Crowley's gone travelling for the year as well. So we're down a few senior players, right? But in fairness, some of the new lads that we have coming in, they're training hard, they're willing to make the 15 really, like a fellow like Tim Twig there. He's not long out of secondary school there, and he's really putting his shoulder to wheel to us. So and Dylan O'Donovan, I think people saw a taste of him last year as well. He's a great, great little player as well. So hopefully we can lend this our new team. It'll be a, it'll be a tough start, but as I said, they're working hard. They're fitting into our setup, no bother, and always wanting to learn, which is great. When you look at at the first game of a, of a group stage like this, it's always important to try and get off to the best possible start. I'm thinking back to last year, Benton, and you beat Clyde, you played the Rovers in your in your first game, and you got that win that did stuck to you to get out of the group and, and progress to the quarterfinals. So, how important is it to try and get off to a good start this weekend? No, that was massive. Yeah. You didn't be- to be honest, that was kind of a shock for us and Clyde, I'd say, to have a winning margin like that. I think we were up uh, one eight, one nine to two points at halftime, something like that. And to be honest, no one saw that coming. And after that, it kind of went downhill a bit because we kind of only barely got out of the group then because we, we drew with Donnie's and we lost to from I. So it's like you think you're on a high, but as I said, the standard of teams in this grade now, like there's no there's no easy games. So even if Skibbereen beat us, like who's going to say the men we are going to beat Skibbereen the next day or Bell and Gary are going to beat Skib. It's it, it is very tough to call. It's probably is the most competitive grade that there is there. Like when you think of the Premier Senior Football Championship, there's still a group within a group there of teams that realistically can win that championship. But when you look at the senior A football, like you could throw a blanket over all the teams in it because it's hard to pick a winner. And this year, especially because there's not much between the teams, Mark. No, exactly. Yeah, and especially the preparation the teams have had. Uh, the change in league, the league system this year as well, that we only had, we had three league games, I think it was divided into two little groups and the top two came out in each group. So everyone is, it's different for everyone, preparation and stuff. But as you said, this Premier premier Senior, there's two or three teams you could say are going to win it, possibly four. But in our grade, it wouldn't be a surprise if anyone won it really, realistically. And uh, big news of end this year. Colin Hearn is back in the, the football hot seat. What's it like having Colin back in there? Obviously, he had great success come back years ago, helping you get out of junior and climbing up that ladder. What's uh, what does Colin bring to the table? No, oh, it's great to have Colin back, yeah. In fairness, I think I, I, I don't know what he said this now, but I'd say he was always going to come back to, to our team and Bannon. Uh, uh, having him, we had two stints with him in junior, and even the year we, we won the West Cork the first year with him, and we lost to Ken Turk, I think, in the semi final. And just the organisation he has, everything is laid out. Uh, even when we came back after lockdown training, we were given a text. These are the dates for training lads. These are the matches. Work around your holidays. And in fairness, you, if you're if you're going away or anything with family, or you just let him know. And he is very understanding. But the way he he kind of sets everything up, I think hurling and football realistically, because when things are so well organised in hurl and football, the hurling has to be the exact same. You know, because people you don't want to drop your standards. So it is great having Colin back. Yeah, and he. He has great ideas and everything, in fairness, yeah. And you mentioned the hurling there, and this was Ben, as, as a dual club, you're about to hit a really busy period, Mark. Um, obviously, football this weekend, then the weekend after, I'm looking, it's, it's a Kent Turk on the, on the 11th is your opening um, hurling game. So it's going to come ticking fast over the next couple of weeks. But it was almost the same last year with the, the first year of, of these, um, these new look uh, county championships. What did you learn from last year juggling hurling and football that you can apply to this year? Uh, I suppose recovery is a big thing. Uh, the, the the system is brilliant. In fairness, I know it's a bit tighter now again with the, with um, lockdown and stuff. But if you had an extra week off between them, I think it's the ideal scenario really because we're playing games constantly. And I think just that extra break, you have, you'll be playing four in a row. I think again this year, four weeks in a row, and then we have a week off, and then there's another two. And then if you get out of the group, you have to play the week after again and the week after that again. So we actually had four and four last year. So by the end of it, you could say, I'd say we ran out of steam a bit. In fairness, people were over their feet, but uh, hopefully 
we're a bit fitter this year, hopefully, into these news of some of the new lads breaking into our team. Hopefully they'll have no fear and they'll just go for it, hopefully. You've talked a couple of times about this injection of youth. How important is that for Ben? And like you said, the likes of James Donovan now, oh, he's he's flying with the road bowling in fairness to him. He's true to the true to the, the, the county final, the Munster final there, like he's doing great stuff. But to get those young players true, like that's so important for Brendan football going forward that you can bring in these young lads, give a taste of senior A football against the likes of Skib and Donnings and Ben and Geary. And that it, it's important that conveyor belt keeps turning up the players. Yeah, exactly. Uh, James is yeah, he's playing it in the bowling already. Right? Was that the two the two two of his scores there the last few weeks? And the football was holding him back. I'd say the last few years, there'd be no stop. You know, I'd say, um, really, uh, probably this. Uh, what would you say? Realistically, I suppose injecting youth in, you'd like to have one or two brought in every year if you had the ideal scenario, really. Like, but like our team since I've been playing, it's been the same 12, 13 players hurling and football roughly, and. This year and last year is the first two years really that there's been a massive change in in players or overturning players. So, but that's not a bad thing either. I suppose getting thrown into the deep end, you just have to learn the tough way. Whether you win or lose, it'll be a learning curve for all of us this year again. And hopefully, we'll build another jewel team in the coming the coming twelve months, twenty four months. And as a player, how much you look forward to the next couple of weeks? Obviously. There wasn't much uh, at the start of the year, like there was lockdown and so on. Then, then we got back on the field and we had the, the revamped county leagues, which were smaller than what we're used to. But now we're coming into championship season. Like, is it, is there, is, would there be nervous before the, game, before the game? Like, will you get the championship here? Like, what's, what's it like before looking forward to a busy couple of weeks of action? Ah, yeah, just don't be. If you, if, you, if you didn't have nerves going to every game, there'd be something wrong with you, really, like, because you. You want to win, you want to perform, you want to help out your teammates. It's not about you, it's about 1,500 people or the extra five or six who come on. Uh, I don't know, the the way the training has been going, in fairness, has been, the, people have been, all our lads have been working very hard. It is it is hard to juggle the hurling and football realistically because you're doing hurling Tuesday, football Thursday, and then you'd have a football match and it'd be vice versa the week after. So there probably isn't the same amount of time to get fit realistically that we missed out in Monday or January, February, March, April. Like people have were doing things at home, but you do you do need to be together really to be pushing each other on and there's nothing like a bit of camaraderie there when you're training and when people are resting, everyone seems to be driving each other on. So that is the only downside I would say to this year, but everyone's looking forward to playing championship. Yeah, that's what you want. The league games are good to get going, but there's nothing like championship games. And I know this is probably a cliche, but considering the schedule of games that you've coming up in both football and hurling, is it really one game at a time? Like, you can't look past um, skip this week and even cast the mind to, okay, we've got hurling hurling the following Saturday. You really have to just live in the moment and focus on the next game, the next game, the next game. Yeah, more so for dual clubs, dual clubs, I think, really, because you're literally going from jumping from one to another. At least if you were just doing football, you'd be playing this week and you'd have a two-week break. So you could say, right, if we have any injuries this week, we have two or three weeks to get them back. So you are kind of planning for those games. But when you're playing every week, you literally have to see how people are Monday and Tuesday the day after and see, plan for that week then. Who do I have? Who do I not have? Was this fella going well? Was this fella, is he better coming on? You know, it's, you do, there's no other way to do it. You have to go week by week. And finally, so, and just to come back to, to, the, to the young Bending players coming through, and it's great to see them coming through. As one of the more experienced lads, Mark, have you found yourself almost taking on this mental of, just showing them the ropes and so on. Like you've been there, you've done that, you've won counties, and you've achieved so much. But when you have these young fellas coming through, they're probably looking up to you and, and the older guys and because you've achieved so much. So would you kind of take a hands-on role and kind of just help them settle into life at football and hurling at this level? Mm, I suppose, yeah. But as we still as I said, we still have a few lads older than me, like Darren Crowley, Pat Prendergast, uh, Keno Manny, Peter Murphy. There's still a lot of people... They'd be nearly the, the more leaders, talkers than me, really, realistically, to be, especially Pat Prendergast. Sure, he's, he's been playing it for I don't know how long, and people have seen what he's done and his commitment to the J. He's, he's actually even tra- helping us out, training us in hurling this year because it was hard to get management at the start. So he's giving everything to us. So I think he's the main fellow people look up to, I'd say, in our club, realistically. Yeah. I, think, uh, I, I don't know if when Pat does no attention to Pat hanging up his boots anytime soon. Like, I'm not sure how many seasons. He's gone over, but it's incredible to see someone like him coming back year after year after year because it's such a great example for everyone. Oh, definitely, yeah. Even even I was talking to him last night there. Even the soccer club are trying to get him back for games as well. 
so they see they see what they're missing when he's not playing playing in between the sticks for them as well. But he he obviously loves it, yeah. And I suppose he always says the younger people coming through keeps him entertained and he enjoys getting out in the open. And you'd often see his kids down watching his training as well now. So kind of a family thing for him as well. Oh, no, great stuff. No, brilliant. No, best of luck this Saturday and you kick off against Stephen I have a couple of busy weeks ahead, so I hope it all works out for you, Mark. Cheers. Thanks a million. We all have dreams, but dreams by their very nature can be difficult to achieve. That's where Access Credit Union comes in. Whether it's going to college, owning a car or building your dream home, your local credit union can help you to fulfil your dreams. Access Credit Union. Funding dreams for over 50 years. The Irish Offshore Rowing Championships take place this weekend and are being hosted by Bantry Rowing Club. In a few moments, we're going to hear from Dermot Murphy and Andrew Hurley, who are both involved in organising this event. But Kieran, before we hear from the two lads, maybe give us a bit of an insight into what offshore rowing is as opposed to the rowing that we've all become so familiar with over the last number of years. Yeah, offshore rowing um, should not be confused with river rowing and river rowing is synonymous with Paul O'Donovan and Fintan McCarthy and Skibbereen Rowing Club. Um, river rowing is two kilometres straight lane, A to B, as fast as you can, as Andrew Hardy will, will explain to us now quite soon as well. With offshore rowing, it's from A to B to C to D as fast as you can. So it's out on, on the high waves. It's a four kilometre course. There's there, there's turns there. It's not straight lanes. There's fierce excitement in, in, in these these races. So um, it's great that these these national championships are being held in Bantry and hosted by Bantry, uh, Bay, um, by Bantry Rowing Club. Um, it's a real coup for the club to bring these championships here because we'll have clubs from all over the country travelling down to Bantry, travelling down to West Cork, and batting it out for all Ireland honours. And there's a couple of, of Olympians um, taking part as well, as far as I know, La Monica Dukarska and, and Ronan Byrne will be in, in different boats. So it's going to be a very exciting couple of days of action this Saturday and Sunday. And the likes of Andrew Hurley, he's a very experienced rower himself as well. He's represented um, his club at, at world level at, at a couple of um, uh, uh, coastal rowing championships over the years. And he's also the regatta secretary this weekend. So He's a, he's a very busy couple of days on offer, but it promises to be super, super couple of super Saturday and Sunday. It's a it's a big event. Uh, Bantry Rowing Club have put out all the stops. Um, they feel really confident that they will put on a good show, and I've, I've no doubt they will. Um, there's some really, really good people in, involved in that club and uh, involved in, in organising this event. And the whole town of Bantry has got behind the championships too, which, which is great to see. So as you'll hear now from Andrew... For Andrew and Dermot, they're really excited about what this weekend will offer. A uh, huge weekend of rowing in the offing in Bantry this weekend, as Bantry Rowing Club is hosting the Swift Irish Offshore Championships on Saturday and Sunday. Huge event for, 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 for Bantry Rowing Club and for the local sporting um, for the local sporting circles. I'm delighted to be joined by two of the men involved in organising this, this huge event. Um, Regatta Director Dermot Murphy and Regatta Secretary Andrew Sheehan. Welcome to the podcast, lads. Thanks, Gary. I want to come to you. Thanks very much. First, Andrew, this is the, the Irish Offshore Rowing Championships. It's one of the, the big events of the year. But can you explain to us first and to our listeners what offshore rowing is and, and how it differs from what we've seen in the Olympics um, a couple of weeks back? Yeah, absolutely. So um, offshore rowing falls under Rowing Ireland as well. But it, whereas our river rowing and the Olympic lads, they kind of took on the narrower boats. Offshore rowing is the, the wilder cousin. So the boats are wider. They're still sculling, so it's an oar on each hand. But the race distance and the type of race is very different. So Paul and Finton, down a straight lane, A to B as fast as you can. For the offshore, it's a 4K course. It's not a straight line. There's wide turns. There's no thing as a lane. It's a case of navigation is a huge part of the racing. And so it's double the Olympic distance. So Olympics is 2K, this is 4K, and it's A to B to C to D as fast as you can. And there can be a little bit of tussling with getting around markers and turns. 
Um, and there's four main events, the single, double, quad, and then there's also a mixed double. And we're excited for the Irish Championships because we're the first year to bring in the under 18 quad as well. Like you said there, like it's it's a 4K course. It's twice as long as, as what viewers and listeners would have seen in, in the Olympics. But there's so much involved. Like there's so much excitement when it comes to offshore rowing as well, because the the race can ebb and flow. There's twists and turns. Like each race is a story in itself. Absolutely, and with drone technology now, people can really get stuck in and see these races. Would I mean if you can get a camera on a turn. It's, it's like watching race car driving, really, or watching mountain biking. There's a lot going on. You can really see people trying to figure out how do I pick this line going in, this line going out, and how do I maybe avoid a collision here and pick that perfect line, take into account the tide. And when you get hit by a wave in one of these boats, you know it. And dear Ms. Andrew mentioned it there as well about offshore rowing coming under the wrong Ireland umbrella in the last couple of years. And offshore rowing is a sport too, and a, a rowing discipline that's growing and growing. It's getting stronger and stronger. Have you noticed, it, noticed that yourselves, that there's a lot more interest in offshore rowing these last couple of years? Definitely. Um, like we've been at it for a number of years. Andrew has been away to the World Championships representing us, I think, four or five times this stage, which has given our club a huge profile with it, really. And... We're kind of veering towards offshore at the moment. Um, like as Andrew was saying, there's a lot more to it than just rowing flat out in a straight line for 2K. I mean, I've been out in races where the likes of Andrew, who's a lot younger than I am, only two races within a race. And there's a lot of skill and a bit of cuteness involved as well and using the waves, the wind and everything. So, you know, if you're rowing in a six-lane race and in a scara and you're you're not as fit as a younger guy, he's going to destroy you if he's technically as good as you or whatever. Whereas here you can, you know, you can get a lucky break, lucky wave, and puts everybody in with a chance, you know. And it's it's um it's better fun, I think, to be honest with you. There's great crack at it. Um and you get some very exciting venues, you know, including Bantry, obviously. And, and like we said as well, or I might have said it yet, but offshore rowing has been tipped for the Olympics in, in the next couple of cycles, which is very exciting as well. So it's a discipline of rowing that people in West Cork and beyond are going to become very, very familiar with over the next couple of years. And this weekend, it's right here on our doorstep. It's in Bentry. It's going to be an incredible spectacle. And do you ever talk to me about for Bentry Rowing Club to host the Irish Championships? Like, how, how big a deal is this and how much of a coup is it for the club? Oh, it's a great honour, to be honest with you. Um, like we hosted a, a regatta at the event last year. We'd applied before then, but last year was our... We were kind of more concerned about having a good venue to do it because we know the harbour itself is, is a great venue. We've hosted big events like the Atlantic Challenge there in the past over 10 days. And, you know, we, we're not afraid to run big events there, but to have the national titles so the United Championships coming here is our... Look, we're delighted to host it. I mean... We have a huge local support, on water support, which is the main thing, really, um, to run a, a good quality and a safe event, you know. Um, and all the local guys with boats and ribs and everything, they're all on board. Um, and, like, you know, people in town are delighted. It's great. We're really, really happy with it. And I'd like to have a few of the, I suppose, the fresh Olympians coming in, participating in a number of the events as well, gives it a little bit of a better profile. So, um, yeah, it is, it's, it's great for town. And you can see the hotels and everything else like that, restaurants and everything are getting... A lot of inquiries and it's good you know the business is kind of is that side of it as well you know that um the, the greater community benefit from it i suppose in some ways and also have the um have such a high profile event on their doorstep you know like i said it's great that it, it's here on, on, like you said there dear it's it's here on our, on our back door it's on our doorstep it's a national championships and Andrew, um, you are a roar as well. Like you're going to be double jobbing next weekend with the, as well as being so much involved in the organising and the running, running of the event. Yeah, you'll be racing as well. Talk about the course. It's a 4K course. What can roars expect in Bantry this weekend? Um, with Bantry, because the area is relatively sheltered, it, it gets quite compressed. There's a few nice wind channels coming in. So if anybody hasn't done a bit of practising rough water, they're in for a bit of a surprise. But the course itself is in Bantry Inner Harbour. So we've got a lot of landmarks. So the course itself starts at the Bantry Aerodrome or Bantry Airstrip. So it's one of the largest venues ever offered in, I think, in any rowing regatta ever really in Ireland. Um, plenty of space. So from a COVID-19 perspective, we couldn't be safer at the location. But the course runs from the airstrip right into the heart of the harbour. The first turn, all the boats will be turning with Bantry House in the background, straight over towards Whitty Island. If anybody's on Whitty Island having a pint, they'll be able to see boats flying past and it's a zigzag back up and the last leg of the course comes pretty much parallel to the airstrip so 
it'll pretty much look if, if there was a plane landing they'd be landing right over the boats so it should be a good challenging course but a very fair one there's no obstacles on the course anything like that so if if anybody makes any mistakes it's on them and andrew from a local point of view are there many bentry rowers taking part a lot of our rowers this time around have kind of leaned into the volunteer role so we have a good lot of adult rowers who mightn't be at the level of the the top medalists so we've kind of made the choice this year that a lot of them have said right for the good of the event they're going to lean towards volunteering so i think we have a couple in the men's single including myself we have a mixed double um but we our, our men's squad and women's squad have graciously said they're going to make sure it's a well-run event and we'll come in to wreck the heads of the, the clubs running it next year instead. Andrew, what is it about offshore rowing that attracts you? Initially, it was transitional. So I spent a lot of time on the riverside of rowing, came out of the sport for a bit and getting back into sport isn't that easy because it's kind of a seven day a week commitment. The offshore rowing offered me something different. The, the race courses were different. It wasn't in a scar or blessing in every time. We were going to places like Bantry, various coastal areas around the country I hadn't been before. And coming in with a, a river sculling background, I was coming up against these guys who maybe didn't scull as well, but for some reason they were kicking my butt because they could read the waves. They could figure out how to get around course turns. So I slowly, I got nabbed after my first race and I haven't looked back since. And we're starting to see that a lot where you guys maybe who transitioned out of the sport are coming back into offshore and now the juniors are starting to come up through that as well and you have a lot of river clubs like sit have a fantastic women's program we're seeing shandon come into the mix now and a lot of river clubs are finding out that these offshore boats not only allow you a way to do more racing they facilitate training so they're a great training boat and should the events go towards the olympics then they've gotten the bandwagon good and early it's brilliant. It all sounds fantastic. And at the end as well, it was mentioned earlier that that Bantry held, you could almost call it a pilot event last year, kind of an offshore regatta to set the scene for this year. How important was that in 2020 to run that regatta and almost get the feel of what this weekend will be like? I suppose last year it was very important in two ways because, I suppose firstly, um, we were the only other regatta, offshore regatta held outside of the Port McGee Championships, to the offshore championships that were held in Port McGee, so it gave a lot of the crews kind of a, a race before the champs which was great and it made sure that the event was fairly well attended and that then um gave us a good idea how things were going to go for us this year we, we kind of put a lot of time into it last year um like i said earlier we're not we're not afraid to run events we're able to do it but then you know it's a new it's a new kind of discipline for us to host and we were very very happy with it to be honest with you because the space down there like andrew said um, we've been kindly donated the space by Royal Pharmaceuticals in Bantry. Um, they shut down the aerodrome for three days. It's, a, it's a, an official aerodrome, so they have to do that. Um, and they've been more accommodating, and the space we have down there is huge. So we can, all the crews would have their own space. We trialled it last year, it worked. We have a few things to tweak, not an awful lot. Um, but, you know, we were happy with it. And certainly doing it last year was, you know, you, again, like, We'd rather make the mistakes last year than this year, you know. Um, but we're, we're confident enough that, you know, um, we're, we've a lot of planning done and we've been working very hard with the, the offshore committee from Rowing Ireland that Andrew's also on. We have a bit of overlap and um, we've met a few times and we have our list of boxes to tick and we're getting through those, so we're quite happy with it. And logistic ways too, Dermot, like there, there's an awful lot involved in hosting an event like this. So talk to us too a small bit about where are clubs coming from? What's the spread of clubs like um, who are taking part this weekend? And, and even how much is involved behind the scenes to run an event like this? Because we'd see the results this weekend when all the action takes place, like the sensational action in Bantry, like it'll be a weekend to remember. But like we won't see all the hard work that you've done in the background. So even how far out did you start planning for this? I suppose your last question answers that. That uh, well, initially that we we had a crack at it last year, um, and then we realised, look, okay, we can do this and we can do it on a larger scale. And um, like oh, Andrew also mentioned as well, we have a lack of rowers this year because we realised the importance of having people, we we'll say like beach masters, that have to do the safety checks before they go on the water. These guys have to be rowers that they know what to look for. Um, as I said, safety is very, very important. All the guys driving the ribs on the water, all rowers as well. Going back to my, my dad's vintage, who's in his mid-70s, we've one or two lads out in ribs there as well that have been rowing for Bantry since the, cl the club's foundation. All these guys would have rowed the gigs 
everything else in the past, the, the, the all, we have the knowledge is there to run a good event and all these guys have been used to doing it. So we've sacrificed our roars to run the event really, I suppose, in many ways. Um, so look, we're kind of happy that the guys on the ground, um, you know, they have, they have the mileage. So we'll, we'll run a good event, I guess, based on that alone. And Andrew, I almost loaded too much in, in Dermot's question there, but just uh, just for you, um, clubs from around the country, who can we expect to travel down to Bantry this weekend? Um, so we have them kind of kind of from four corners. So there is a significant number of clubs coming from Northern Ireland. So the strongholds like Donegal Bay, Lockers Point, Carindu, Older Fleet, um, Kilnacilla would be some of the stronger clubs up north. Then as you go east, we have Arklow, Wicklow, um, there is a few smaller clubs that are building and building. And then the real stronghold of density of clubs is South West Cork and South Kerry. So you'll have Bantry, you'll have Myros, you'll have Castletown Bear, you'll have Ring Rowing Club, um, Ross Carberry. And there, a lot of these clubs are coming to us with eight, nine, 10 crews. Whereas a few years ago, they might come at the chance with a quad race or a quad. Now they're coming at us with two quads, three mixed doubles, five or six single scholars from a club. So it's just exploded. Like this board, like we, we've said in this chat, it's grown bigger and bigger. So can we lay the gauntlet down now, Andrew, to, to Paul and Finton? If they really want to prove their worth, they really need to go offshore racing, don't they? Absolutely, absolutely. And look, they want everything else now, so let's put it down. Entry's close tonight, lads, so let's see, yeah, let's see what happens. Andrew, they might, they might, <laughs> they might sneak in, yes, before tonight. Yeah. Um, but no, the lads are aware of this style of rowing. Would have they would have seen it in the past as well, and some of their Olympic um, teammates are going to be racing with us now um, at the championships as well. So hopefully they will be seen. And like that, there's there's a variation on this sport called beach sprinting, which might be heading for the Olympics by 2028. It's it's I'm not the person to make that call by any means, but if it does go to the Olympics, then you're going to see an awful lot of shovels appearing. And the great thing this weekend is that local people can can watch it all unfold in Bantry. In terms so of fans attending the event, what, is there any protocols in place for that? Uh, or what's the what's the state of play if someone from Clannock Kilty is listening to this and they are saying, OK, I want to get to Bantry this weekend to watch that? What's the best piece of advice for them? So officially, it's a no spectator event under current COVID guidelines. However, because the course covers so much of the bay, people can safely watch the race from various points of it, but the venue itself will be closed to athletes and to, to coaches. So unfortunately this year, we can't go inviting people down. If somebody does come down, there is probably a space that they can kind of view a race from a corner, but we'll be asking people to not come down their droves. Unfortunately this time, we'll just have to bring it back again in a few years and do it all again. I oh, know it's going to be a spectacular event this weekend. Just wish everyone involved in the organising the very, very best of luck, and we'll catch up again soon. The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you by Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, funding dreams for over 50 years. Okay, Kieran, before we wrap up this week's podcast, let's quickly take a look at what readers can expect in this Thursday's southern star sports section i've seen a preview of the front page with a pretty nice headline i have to say myself so what else can readers look forward to this weekend uh, it's, it's worked congratulating now the cork senior camogie team who are true to the all ireland final day they, they pulled off a shock they beat the cats they dethroned kilkenny uh, in sensational style last sunday linda collins the, the car captain Disappointed to be dropped from the first 15. She was sprung from the bench late on and she scored a winning point in the 63rd minute. So um, brilliant result for Carter. Truth to the All-Ireland final now where they'll take on Galway in uh, September 12th. That game is on. Um, the only negative, and it is a big negative, um, is Orla Cronin was sent off late in the day. That's in the schemes, Orla Cronin. She was sent off in the 57th minute. Um, so it's going to... We have to wait and see what happens now. Um, uh, Cork are waiting on the referee's report and they'll take it from there. But such a shame because Orla Cronin, I think she's played 80 championship games or, or sorry, 80 games for Cork. She's only had six bookings um, ever. And for, for her to get sent off, it's just um, very disappointing for her. So we'll have to yeah, wait but and see. Let, let's be honest. Like, When was the last time a player sent off in an All-Ireland semi-final actually missed the final? Just the way... I know it's uh, the Camogie Association as opposed to 
the GAA but these things generally just get brushed under the carpet and the star players all, all make their way out for the final so it's almost like uh, they should almost uh, institute a rule whereby if you are sent off in a semi-final it doesn't matter because eventually there will be a big appeals process they'll bring in the big the big hitting solicitors who will find a loophole and fingers crossed as you say we'll see Orla Cronin on the biggest stage because that's where she deserves to be Oh, hopefully, yeah, like Orla, it's, it's, it's an all-star Camogie player. She makes this Cork team tick. She's a, she's just a class act on and off the field. So, fingers crossed and toes crossed, it all works out for Orla over the next couple of days ahead of the Girl Ireland final. So we've that. Um, we'll um, I was saying there about a. Uh, Kesselhaven and Nemo Rangers with a two-page spread on that county uh, Premier Senior football final. We also have a lot of interviews with um, ahead of the, the big throw into the county senior championships the, this weekend. I got up, caught up with Thomas Clancy um, of County Kilty ahead of their game against Ireland Rovers. I've talked to Jason Quilly of Ireland Rovers, their manager. Um, Jerry McCarthy spoken to Jerry O'Reardon, the Carberry Rangers captain, ahead of their game against Air Oak. We also uh, also have interviews with the Donnies manager, the the, the ben, ben Tree Blues manager, Colm Cronin, and, and more. So a lot to for GFNs to sink their teeth into in this Thursday Southern Star. We've we've all the news as well from the the local Carberry uh, Junior A hurling and football championship. So there's a a good few games last weekend. So a lot going on there. Huge weekend too for, for local bowlers at the All Ireland Road Bowling Championships up in um, up in Armagh last weekend. And Hannah Sexton won her fourth All Ireland underage road bowling title. Um Hannah's from Tim League. She's won it's now 216 and 218 All Ireland titles. Um, she's an incredible talent not only in road bowling but she GA as well. She was part of the, the Cork Minor Camogie team that won um the All Ireland Camogie title a couple of years back. So so that's there. So and, and also, um, Emily Hegarty was presented with a West Cork Sports Star of the Month Award at the Celtic Ross Hotel last Wednesday night and had a quick catch up with her after. Um, and even though Jack, she's taken some deserved downtime after her Olympic bronze medal win in Tokyo. After only a couple of weeks off the water, she's just itching to get back on it. And I think that's almost a, a kind of a, a, a peek behind the curtain at the mentality of athletes at that level. They just can't, they just find it hard, I think, to step outside the bubble. She's looking forward to getting back in the water this month, getting getting back rowing, um, getting back into the National Rowing Centre and doing what, what she does best. So congrats to Emily on winning her, her West Cork Sports Star Award. And so there's that interview with Emily and a lot, lot more in Tourist this there. And as always, if you can't make it to the shops, you can always purchase the Southern Star Digital Edition via our website or app. Just go to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper and you can read the Southern Star and the Southern Star Sports section for less than two euro per week. Absolute bargain. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast. We'll be back at the same time next week. If you enjoy these shows, please make sure to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Slán Tomlin.